Good morning. Good morning. All finished coffee. And, um, and then it's time to start up the program again. Um, the same audience as yesterday, I think. A few chairs are, uh, are empty. Uh, the, the colleagues of yours, I think, they had a heavy night <laughs> yesterday evening. Um, I see as well some small eyes. Um, you all stayed, of course, in Arnhem. I talked to a few people who said Arnhem is, is uh, very nice, but the pub's closed at 2 o'clock. Um, well, <laughs> how was yesterday? You had a good time yesterday? Yes. We have to start up a little bit. You know this one? <laughs> it's from yesterday. It's, the, it's a mic. You can talk into the mic. And um, uh, it would be nice to have a few comments on, on yesterday. Uh, but not a, a, a story, not a, a complete uh, lecture, but just uh, what your stomach tells you about what did I learn yesterday, what was the most impressive thing that I learned yesterday. So I'm going to throw the mic into the audience and then uh, just give a few comments. Um, I'm wondering if someone catches this uh, mic or just, you know, just like volleyball, is, uh, um, <laughs> throw him through the audience like a kind of mic waving. That is, that's not going to land, but uh, well, I, I will try it. I just won't look. And just talk into the mic and say what you thought about the Congress yesterday. <laughs> yes. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yesterday, uh, the new uh, vision on smoke in relation to uh, first water on the fire and then that was an uh, interesting. Uh, yes, especially the story about uh, smoke, smoke behavior, and um, it, it was very astonishing that you have to put water on a fire. That's exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Well, <laughs> what what uh, a few years ago we talked about uh, smoke ventilation yeah. and uh, all the stuff behind that case, fire safety engineering, and the new vision on uh, uh, ventilation, water on the fire, close the door. Yeah. New vision. Yeah, and, and the discussion about how do we get this information uh, at the right way to thirty thousand firefighters. firefighters. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You, you may throw the mic uh, to the other side. Oops. Uh, <laughs> nee. Oh. Wij <laughs> liggen aan die kant. Ja. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Mag ook in het Fries. Het <laughs> mag in het Fries. <laughs> nou, dat is goed. <laughs> Wat zie ik dat, hè? Ja, ja dat, zie, dat zie je goed. Uh, yesterday uh, afternoon we had an, uh, a lecture about uh, PPV and uh, the difference between uh, a an, uh, an, uh, an high pressure roll uh, in the uh, flow of, uh, of uh, smoke out of the window. And the difference was uh, very little between the, those two. Yeah. And that was, uh, yeah, I never heard before of that. Yeah, some new insights. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, you, you may throw it wherever you like. Ah, <laughs> yeah, you can book it, but you have it all. Nice, nice. <laughs> uh, the, the presentation uh, uh, from VIPA with uh, the combination with sprinkler and ventilation uh, and the effects, that was an interesting one. Uh, the behavior of the fire and, uh, and smoke uh, in, in the room outside of the, the fire room. Uh, and data collection, that's interesting. Because we're going to uh, have a, a, a big advantage as, uh, as firefighters in the future on uh, all the data, big data, and the, and the way we collect and make it uh, visible for our people. Yeah, yeah, it's getting more and more the data uh, in yeah. the future. Well, we, we can th we throw it one time and then uh, up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't even catch it. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's stuck on your body. Yes. <laughs> it was a wonderful throw. Um, yesterday, uh, well, actually, the door policy was, yeah, was interesting. Uh, was not new, but good to know again. And um, <coughs> the cooling capacity of water during fires. Yeah, I learned some new rules of thumb and some numbers. Uh, so that gave me some new knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's probably knowledge everyone, every firefighter should uh, get sometime, <coughs> somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Ah, it works, it works. Um, this morning, we're going to start the program. We have uh, two keynote uh, speakers, um, and very interesting uh, uh, keynote speakers. Uh, we have Patrick van Hees, he's um, later on the first speaker, and we have Ruud van Herpen, uh, second speaker this morning. And then the third thing we're going to do is uh, the thesis award. Um, and the thesis award is uh, a bachelor or master's uh, um, um, thesis. Uh, from students all over the Netherlands and Flemish uh, part uh, of Belgium. Um, and it's a very imp important uh, award. Um, because uh, 17 years ago, when I saw it uh, yesterday, 17 years ago, I won that thesis award myself. Um, and it was a very impressive uh, moment. Uh, I never won an award with writing something down. Um, and that was a very impressive moment. And um, for the nominates, it's a huge, huge uh, step in your career, because if you win the thesis award on uh, fire safety, um, um, then it's possible, it's possible that uh, 70 or 20 years afterwards, you become the chairman of a congress of fire uh, uh, safety and science. So it gives a huge step in your, uh, in your career. Um, but that, that's later on, the, the thesis award. We're going to start with our first speaker. And then I have to get my classes. First speaker this morning is Patrick van Hees. Professor Patrick van Hees is head of the fire safety engineering division of Lund University in Sweden and had a PhD from the University of Ghent in Belgium. Um, his areas of interest are uh, closely linked to fire performance based designs, fire development and calculation methods. And he is the chairman of the International Association of Fire Safety Science. Patrick van Hees. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Is the sound okay? Uh, fine. And then we have to check this also. Yeah. So, um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for letting me here talk uh, about some of our uh, research um, in, in Lund, at Lund University. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's nice to see a lot of well-known faces for me. I uh, see some people from the postgraduate uh, courses in, in, in Ghent, which makes me very happy. I even see uh, people from our uh, own Swedish uh, education popping up here. Uh, so that's uh, very nice to see. And I see also a lot of people from the local organization, because I've been here a few times uh, in several uh, occasions. So it's nice to, to be back uh, in this part. It's always Nice for me also to be back in a, let's say, Dutch slash Flemish speaking area. Um, although I luckily checked very shortly before this conference whether I had to do the presentation in Dutch or in English. So, uh, so it, it helped at least that it was for my slides in, in, in English. Uh, I do want to say quickly something about our group, a little bit marketing. Uh, between uh, uh, the different countries. Uh, our department, our division, let us say, of uh, fire safety engineering is, is part of the, uh, the Department of Building and Environmental Technology at uh, LTH in uh, Lund University. And we have uh, seven members of, of research staff. Stefan is uh, around here also, he's one of them. Uh, but we also have people working with human behavior, uh, water mist, risk analysis, performance, based design and, and fire development, what is a bit my area. So we have a quite, let's say, complementary group. And I think that's important for the area of fire safety engineering, that you have to, to cover all aspects uh, in, in, in fire safety. Uh, myself, I have a background um, uh, in, uh, I'm an electrical engineer or a mechanical in electrical engineer from the University of Ghent. Uh, and then I went on for my PhD. So I, I, when I started teaching with the students, I'm saying, well, I'm not a fire safety engineer. I'm, I'm not one in the rescue services. I'm an electrical engineer. And then they look a little bit and, OK, are you going to tell me something about fire? But I think this is a very multidisciplinary area. So you learn from each other. And I think this is a 
kind of a message. And we have that in our um, division then. And we have almost 30 years of experience. Um, I have to, I had to adapt these slides because it was still 25, so it was with an old version. And, and we were um, be, we're a bit proud on being one of the first in Europe. I think Edinburgh was a few years earlier, but we started our fire safety engineering education uh, in, in, in Europe. And, and as I said, or when the introduction was there, uh, we have some, let's say, key positions in IFSS, which is the International Association of Fire Safety Science. Please do go on in the website. I think we are reopening the registration of memberships. Uh, we could use much more members from uh, the Netherlands and from Belgium, to be honest. So, um, so that's good. And I also uh, very much involved in standardization, which is somehow a, a task for us uh, at the university to spread our knowledge. If we look to the educational involvement, which I want to say is that I mentioned already, we have our Swedish program for fire safety engineers and uh, the department is responsible for the education, so we have uh, quite a lot of courses in that program. As I said, we, we roughly have 50 students per year. Uh, the education is three years and a half. Uh, some of them go further for becoming Swedish, uh, a Swedish master in risk management. Uh, this means that we are r they're running around 250 or 300 students uh, every time. And then every spring we also get the international students, which we also see uh, a number of people here. Uh, I was forgetting them in the beginning. I look, I see one is already looking a little bit angry on me. So, um, so um, we have these people, and these people they travel around in Europe between Ghent, Edinburgh, and Lund to get their education, and that's also good. Uh, so that means that we have quite a lot of uh, students, and I think it's maybe good to at this. Uh, place and at this uh, time to, to say also why, why is uh, Sweden so successful in, in this education and we have so many students uh, um, and we have also a specific division working with fire safety engineering. We're not part of, we're part of the building uh, department but on the other hand we are completely self-supporting and self-deciding on uh, fire safety and then there are two, uh, to my opinion at least, we can be in Sweden, maybe uh, of different opinions from time to time, but there are two major things which have made this education so successful. And the first thing is that many years ago, when we're talking about 30 years, the government decided that in order to become a rescue leader at the fire, say, fire brigades or the rescue brigades, you needed to have uh, a university degree uh, in fire safety engineering. And on top of that, you had to go one year additional training at the places like Raving, which maybe is known by you, uh, some of you, uh, to become then a, a full rescue leader. And that created, let us say, uh, a need for education automatically. The second uh, large uh, influence on the education was in fact that almost at the same time, maybe a few years later, um, the building regulations changed in Sweden from a uh, purely prescriptive regulation into a performance-based uh, regulation. And that created a need for fire safety engineering uh, engineers sorry, in the consultancy uh, business. So we see that two of the big marketplaces for our students are the fire brigades and the consultancy. But that's not all, of course. They go also to the insurance companies, to the government and so on. So we have succeeded in these 25 or 30 years, and I was not all the time in Sweden, so I uh, don't know what happened really in the beginning. Uh, we have, let's say, integrated Swedish society with uh, academic fire safety engineers. And that is now good when we talk with people that we, we talk somehow at least the same language, unless I start speaking Dutch, of course, then it's a problem. But that's enough maybe of the, the five minutes I use for a little bit of background to know a bit the, uh, uh, the history of, of the division. And of course, as a, a Belgium, I'm very proud to be there also and to, to lead that uh, division uh, after my degree uh, in Ghent. And also there's the automatic link with the University of Ghent still in the uh, Erasmus Mundus and I'm also teaching there. But I'm not going to talk all the time just about our department. Uh, I'll talk a bit about statistics and case studies. And uh, my talk uh, will deal with a few 
let's say, examples. For those who have been in Sweden, uh, it's a, a smorgasbord or a buffet uh, where I take three uh, pieces of, of food out of it and I'll try to give you how we have used both statistics and uh, case studies to further develop, let's say, um, analysis of consequences and also methods to, to reduce the consequences of, of, of fires. And these are arson fires, uh, construction fires. It's uh, sometimes a bit difficult to find the right definition for that, but I'll come back to that later. And uh, let's say residential uh, fires. And I wrap up with, with a few conclusions. Uh, but I think the first thing, and this is probably the most uh, methodology type of slide in, in my presentation, is that I want to, to, to give you somehow a feedback that before we started this work, and I started in uh, Lund University 2007, so about 10 years ago, um, we had done a lot of research, and one of the things I thought was important is that uh, we also would use all the data which is available uh, from the statistics and from, uh, let us say, case uh, studies. Uh, because there's a huge amount of information available uh, which is delivered by the um, the rescue service. And my vision was that we should do and use this data to do research on and to try to uh, find solutions based on what's also happening. You learn by things, uh, you learn by making errors also. We all know that, uh, that's one of the part, but you only want to do it once, uh, hopefully. Uh, sometimes it's not the case. But So and the idea was, uh, in fact, to, to start somehow with the statistics, uh, and we established a, a methodology. Uh, we published it also. I think it's always important with these type of studies that there is a peer review process. Uh, the international reviews were not in the beginning completely agreeing with all the different steps. Uh, but we find out that you, you have first, of course, divine some kind of phenomena or something you are interested in. Uh, you can look to the statistics. Luckily, we have very good statistics in Sweden. I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, and then from these statistics, you can make already some conclusions about this phenomena. Uh, maybe you're not completely happy and you have to, uh, let's say, reiterate uh, a bit by fine-tuning, if you can call it in the academic world, the research question, uh, before you can go to the next step, uh, where you go to case studies. So you dig in, you select a number of specific events based on, on your previous uh, studies, and you do the analysis of them, and you make some conclusions. Maybe you're not fully happy again, and you have to go uh, one time by picking more data because uh, they are not conclusive or so on. So, and this methodology is published in Fire and Technology also. And we used it, um, in, in fact, for these uh, three, ca three cases in, 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 a, in a quite similar way, not maybe one in 100%, because somehow the first case study on arson fires we developed also, at the same time, the methodology and fine-tuned it. Uh, but we could use that. And I think that's quite important to use some kind of a methodology so that you don't uh, start picking uh, the cherries from, from the tree a uh, little bit by how you want to do that. Um, we are lucky, MSB, which is the uh, Swedish Contingency Agency, uh, which is uh, responsible for, let's say, also the education in the rescue services, uh, where one of the training schools is in, in Revingen nearby Lund, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, known uh, by uh, many, at least in, in the Netherlands, who sometimes it's a small Dutch village, to be honest, if we are there. Um, but uh, it's used quite a lot, so that's good. The, uh, the, the agency, or the governmental uh, body, uh, MSP, uh, has their database, which is called EDA, uh, which is containing uh, all the statistics uh, of fires in, 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 um, in Sweden. So at each intervention, uh, the fire brigade feeds that into the national database, um, which means that you have a huge amount of, of data. Uh, luckily also that uh, depending a bit on the cases, but uh, that database contains also a lot of case studies where the fire investigators have uploaded their uh, investigation report so that you can use them. Uh, unfortunately, it's not all, of course, because you cannot expect with all the amount of fires every year that every fire is investigated with a full report. It sometimes 
just ticking the intervention sheet box, and that goes down into the statistics. But we have data in that, and uh, it's in fact uh, a database which is publicly available. The only thing you have to do is to, to learn a little bit of Swedish. But for you uh, people, uh, it takes. It took me uh, less than a year, so you should be there doing much better, I guess. Um, so, um, in order at least to understand, speak is something else. But um, um, so that database is there. It contains data on ignition sources if they were determined, of course, but also on spread of fire and so on. So quite a lot of uh, data, and they try to extend the amount of parameters more and more. Uh, and that's important. Uh, so you can get, for instance, for these uh, uh, tools, and if we talk about arson fires in school, which is my first topic, a kind of a pre-introduction of, that this is something you can get out of this database, um, as an example. Uh, and it goes also an example that when you use statistics, you have to use a methodology, and you have to think about that, how to use it. Because what do we see here? Um, the peak happens, uh, of course, during school time, and it's uh, roughly about lunch time. And this is the amount of fires. Uh, you see that we are, uh, um, this is a period of, of 10 years, so it's, uh, um, the project started at that time in 2007, so um, it's not yet updated, but it gives almost the same data if we would add the last uh, other 10 years. Uh, the first conclusion was that uh, if we have to prevent uh, arson fires, we have to, to focus maybe on, on, on these ones. But these are the ones where maybe the, the, um, the students are just putting a, a piece of paper in fire and uh, activate the fire detector and the automatic fire alarm comes and then there is an intervention. But these are not most of the time the big problems. And the big problems happen uh, a little bit more uh, here and here during the evening and the night. I'll, uh, I'll show you that later in the slide. So what I don't want to say in this speech is that you can solve everything with statistics. Uh, if you want to go to a problem where you want to see maybe why are there so big fires and why are the costs so high. Uh, if you want to see when the fires, this is quite nice and quite interesting also that you see this kind of type of trend from this database. I could show tons of these kinds of slides, uh, but I just want to pick one, because this was somehow when we started to research uh, the common knowledge in Sweden, well, the fires are happening always during the breaks. Yeah, uh, if we consider the breaks after, after school hours in the evening, then uh, that's okay. But it was mainly during the school breaks, and that was not the biggest problem. So when we, we look to this first example on arson uh, in school, I try to sketch a little bit, we, uh, and I give a few slides later on it, we, we have a specific problem. Uh, we did evaluations, uh, both with statistics, even we added to the case study some experiments in the whole project, uh, but, uh, and then solutions, and then we, we have some results where we also looked into uh, a bit the economical uh, part. So, uh, so this is a bit uh, the problem, let's say, and, and you maybe say, well, problem, is, is this now a, a problem? Well, I try to bit make my case uh, for that. Um, Sweden at that time uh, had about four to five hundred school fires a year. That means more than one a day. Um, so uh, have, a, have a seat. Um, this nice, nice country in the, in the north. So, uh, so uh, for more than 40 percent, the biggest problem was the property problem. During all these years, we did hardly have anybody being injured or killed during the fire. And I think that's an important thing, which means a connection to the building regulations, which in Sweden focus on life safety. That means that for the building regulation, uh, sorry to say it maybe a bit to rush, there was no real problem because there were no people killed. So for the insurance company, that maybe could not be the same case. There was really uh, a problem, because the, the cost at that period, and I'm talking now backwards a little bit, um, was about 50 million euros per year or so. And this was just a rough estimate, because most of the insurance company, when you ask them what the costs are for certain fires, they give you a big, large 
broad numbers, but they don't give you details. So we had to quite a lot of problems in this project to get detailed information of specific. Uh, we had to, to find it ourselves a bit. And one of the things we also noticed then uh, is that 1% of all these files are then responsible for almost 50% of the cost. So if you want to tackle the problem of property, you have to catch this 1%. Or this is just, these are not, let us say, numbers where you have to say this is the truth, but this is uh, indications if you look into the statistics also. And that was a bit... Uh, uh, the problem where, well, I think this was one, in fact, a fire where Stefan had to have a look on when he did his uh, uh, shift uh, in uh, nearby by Lund, so that we had big losses of uh, school fires in um, um, Sweden. And this is a, just an overview of that year, 2009 was, was the peak for the research year, uh, with the numbers, and this is in uh, Swedish crown, so you have to divide by roughly 10. Uh, of, of different schools everywhere a bit in, in Sweden. And these uh, two or six fires were responsible for almost uh, that year for 50 uh, million of, of euro, 500 million of Swedish crowns. So uh, the insurance company and also the research funding agencies thought, okay, we need to start doing something on that. Uh, so we have to start an, inter an interdisciplinary project um, arson is, of course, not only something which you can solve technically. I'm going to talk a lot about technically because I'm an engineer also, but we have people working with, the, let's say, the non-technical part, which is as important to know why people are doing this suddenly. Why are people destroying their future? It means the schools, uh, because they want to have education. And so, so this is quite a, a sensitive issue, and we have to dig to that. Uh, together with people from uh, the social faculty uh, and also from psychologists and so on. So we, we, we looked on that. So that was a bit the problem, how we tried to solve it from the technical. So um, Lund University, together with uh, RICE, which was uh, at that time SP, um, took part, let's say, mainly on the technical part. So we used, in fact, statistics, case studies, and we said, OK, we, within a performance-based design, we need to establish a number, at least, kind of design fires. What are these typical fires who start the process? If you look to the final result, you see a fully developed fire, a full school being destroyed, and so on. But what, what is, let's say, initiating design uh, fire? So we looked at that. What type of technical systems can be used? Uh, for, and also, last but not least, uh, you can protect everything uh, if you invest uh, a lot. Uh, but that's not, of course, there should be some kind of a cost-benefit. And we cope with this problem more and more, that we can find the technical solutions. But, uh, and I think Peter gave also an example yesterday, you cannot just extend that the cost become uh, a lot. So some there are uh, there's the money part in, in the picture also. So, uh, what were typically design fires? And that was a bit interesting, uh, because we have our building regulation in Sweden, and they have, uh, certainly now, they have even templates or recommended design fires for uh, residential fires. Uh, it's, it's roughly the Alpha T square um, fire uh, inside the room, with furniture or uh, in a bedroom and so on. So, uh, and in offices, you, you have the typical office fires. Uh, you can uh, uh, find there the uh, design fire. But what we found is that uh, two of the major things were external fires. Combustibles, waste at the outside, as you could see here. Um, the, the, the persons uh, doing the arson found, unfortunately, more than 90% of these cool fires are arson-related, so there are, not, there are only a few accidental fires. So they, uh, they throw uh, waste and combustible liquids to the facade and uh, start burning that. They use furniture and so on, so we had to, to establish this kind of facade fire. A fire, design fire, which is not in the building regulations. Uh, so next one is that uh, it even was motorbikes. A few cases were even cars. They just push the car towards the facade 
and put fire on the, on the car. Uh, somewhere we had to be realistic that we could not do the worst of the worst, so we used the bike. And then you have the indoor. Indoors, uh, a lot of waste, combustible liquids, Molotov cocktails they're throwing on into the classrooms, uh, and then you have um, uh, quite much more intensive fire. Sounds like a war zone here, I guess, but uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I have to keep you awake a little bit, so... Uh, uh, and then also fireworks. The fire I showed where, uh, I think, um, which was uh, a bit early in one of the slides, um, was nearby Lund, and it was fireworks uh, who ended up in some kind of a storage room uh, and, and put the whole school on fire. So, uh, so this, uh, these are the design fires. Um, and I jump a little bit on all the, I don't going to give all the technical solutions, but we... Uh, uh, looked also then immediately when the technical solutions were in place for this type of design fires, uh, we looked a little bit on cost-benefit. When can we impose a requirement? Is it still beneficial for society? It's uh, maybe a, a very super flu uh, statement, but it's an important, and it's, not e it's easy to say. It has to be cost-beneficial, but it's not easy to prove. So we had to do somehow uh, an analysis. And there we... Uh, when we used, let's say, case studies and statistics, we had found the design fires and so on. Here we did also some experiments uh, at Ravinger. We built a little bit of a roof. Uh, it doesn't look really like a school, but okay. Uh, sometimes you have to have some imagination if you're a fire uh, scientist. And we put a number of, let us say, fires on, on it. And we used, in this case, uh, which we had, of course, um, noticed in all these case studies, what was the biggest problem the fire was almost always detected too late. Um, very simply, uh, all the schools have uh, requirements for detectors inside the building. But if you put the fire on the outside, when will the detector inside the school uh, give an alarm? Yeah, you can wait long, and sometimes you can wait so long that even the fire brigade was there before something uh, was detected inside. The, the old attic was burning and so on. So many cases it was people around the school who were just had visually detected. In a few cases, luckily, there was also some kind of detection system that it was somehow uh, too long from. So we looked a lot onto detection systems to catch at least these uh, fires on the outside. Because, uh, uh, let's say, the facade fires, attic fires, and so on. So we used different kind of uh, detection systems in the attic, at the facade, detection cables around for kind of a complete uh, full uh, coverage uh, of the school. And we use different type of uh, facade, combustible, incombustible, and so on. So I'm not going to go into the details. Um, otherwise, I don't get to the end of my presentation. And, and we also then use two typically school buildings which were uh, popping up from, let's say, the case studies. Uh, and we don't know code to have to, but you had two buildings, one about uh, 1,200 square meter, another 5,000 square meter. And, and we used some data for, let's say, lifetime for uh, the active systems and so on. Uh, and, and with that, we did an, uh, a cost-benefit analysis. And then you can say, okay, how did you link that? Of course, we linked that to the statistics and the occurrence of the fires from the statistics. So we could say, um, and we could also do it on national level and on regional level and at city level. So we did a number of, of so um, statistics. You have to, to use then event trees and so on. So I'll come back to that a little bit uh, later also in another uh, application. So summing up that, um, what we found out is that uh, um, these typical scenarios are not covered by the building regulations. So if we want to do something, either the building regulations have to be changed or the insurance company have to increase their demands at the moment they approve the, uh, the filing. And that's a little bit the frustrating thing. The only thing maybe what came into the building regulations from this project was that uh, when designing uh, apartment buildings that you had to look to the spread from a window fire into an attic. So that was something they had uh, could add because that was linked them more to apartment than residential buildings. But for the school buildings, they're 
didn't come so much from the building regulations. And the building regulations are uh, governed by um, our, let's say, governmental body, who is, is part of, uh, uh, let's say, the building uh, economical uh, department in, uh, in Sweden. So that means that if you want to change something, in the regulation, you have really to prove that there is a cost benefit. And we, in fact, at national level, uh, even we look to the detection cables, smoke detectors on the attics, and intermessing cavity vents, and so on. Uh, we could not uh, fully have a case to say that nationally you could impose also uh, some kind of guidance that you have to use this kind of detection system. We knew that worked, so for the, there were a lot of schools starting to install them. Uh, but at national leveling, looking to the mere statistics of the whole country, uh, this was uh, not a full case. On the other hand, what was very clearly that in areas, I'm not going to name the cities now, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Sweden where there was a higher occurrence of uh, school fires, it was a positive outcome. So in these cases where suddenly you could see that the trend was changing or that you could see that there is a trend ch changing that you could start imposing certain requirements um, from a, which are cost beneficial if you look on the lifetime of the whole uh, school. So um, I think that was, was good because we could at least indicate that in the areas where some of these school fires uh, happened and I was quite often also a bit more the big cities, uh, no, but it was uh, uh, something which then you could install, for instance, detection cable around uh, the school to, to um, detect the fire in, in time. So um, this, this could at least result in lower cost. And what we have seen is now uh, we are 2018 and uh, last year I said to the, the funding agencies now, we had this project and we, we came with all these results. Can we 10 years later have a look a little bit what happened now? Because if you look into the statistic, we still have uh, about, unfortunately, uh, roughly 300 school fires in Sweden. But are we capturing the big ones or not? So we have to go with this methodology once more. And we got funding there also. So next year we will start looking as kind of an effective uh, effect, sorry, effect analysis of this research project. <coughs> what did we do technically? What we do also non-technically? How much tried we to inform people how to think about uh, fire safety of, of, of schools and so on, which has been uh, enormously. Um, so there is somehow a decreasing trend uh, being seen, uh, but we are also interested, and then we have to go, of course, also to the insurance companies who uh, or being willing also to, to open their cases uh, to look onto the cost. So that's uh, about uh, arson uh, fires in, uh, in schools, uh, something which if we went to international conference and I got the reaction here also, uh, people are always shocked that we have this or that we had this amount of large uh, numbers of, of school fires. Um, so, uh, and it's, of course, politically very, very uh, sensitive. Um, after this project, we, we went into something else where we uh, had seen that uh, it was um, important maybe to look to. We, we have uh, these two type of fires, let's say, um, compartment fires, we, we lo we've learned a lot. We have um, we we'll train how to extinguish them, we we'll train how to prevent them and to design the buildings for them. Uh, we do that also for large atria, there's a lot of fire safety engineering cases on this big. Uh, but we saw also from time to time in, in our discussions with uh, the rescue serve that you have this so kind of constructional uh, fires or fires in structural elements. And it's a little bit difficult to define that, there's no real maybe international definition for that, but we use there also this uh, methodology where we define some of our fire in structural elements. I'll come back to that uh, when we talk about the results. Uh, try to describe also the fire development and, one, and doing not only statistics but also interviews uh, and literature uh, reviews. And then we went into the case studies. We picked up from the database uh, EDA uh, a number of uh, um, typically 
fires, which were so-called uh, fires in structural elements. And uh, I'll uh, see that we did interviews, you can see with the rescue service, with the Fire Protection Association, with uh, MSB, which is the governmental, and we did a number of uh, analysis events. And we tried also to be in such a way that it's always easy to pinpoint what's going wrong. And say, so, okay, this didn't work, and that uh, was wrong. But we tried also to look into uh, a number of cases where we had some kind of a successful outcome. And that's a bit more possible if you go into the cases and you pick up the structural fires on luckily a little bit less than maybe the ones on, on arson, but uh, they are still a number. And we did analysis with uh, fault trees. Um, so we took about a dozen fires over a two years period, and, and for each of them we did a so-called uh, fault tree analysis. I'm not going to go into the, the theory, but this is a, an example. And we, we divided them, though, both then the fires with extensive damage, and then fires where you could consider that somehow they were successfully uh, managed. And, and those we try to collect, and it's not the idea at all that you can read this. It just g gives you an idea. These event trees, they grow and they grow and they grow, and at the end of the day, you can't get them on, on such a page. You need almost a whole wall, and, and they can get a bit complex. So, but uh, they are uh, good tools to do uh, this kind of analysis. The interesting thing is that you can link this to probabilities and so on, and use statistics and so on, and get some outcome if you want to do this final um, so let's say cost-benefit analysis. So this uh, was for the uh, um, constructional fires. Uh, what type of fires did we pick up there? Uh, there are, in fact, two types of fires uh, in that. And I try to, to make it somehow covering everything. It's uh, um, not a full definition. We had the so-called hidden fires, concealed spaces, uh, walls, Facades, but then inside, let us say, the facade system. Uh, and we had also uh, the, in the building material, inside the facade system. So, um, of course, if you say hidden fires, and I show this picture, this is not really a hidden fire, but it uh, maybe was before the fire went, a fully developed fire, that it was a hidden fire. Uh, and, and you want to maybe prevent somehow occurring this by knowing what, what could happen. The characteristics are somehow uh, different because the, the, the fire dynamics, if we go down to the theory, is, is quite different depending on the type of fire here. Uh, if it's inside the construction and inside the wooden structure, inside the attic, or it's somehow starting inside the facade and then comes out of the, uh, the system. Uh, so it changes a little bit from the normal compartment fire uh, thinking. And that's uh, maybe the challenge. We, I think also we in Sweden we have built up our knowledge on compartment fires, and we have quite good knowledge, but maybe we should start learning a bit more about all these type of, of fires also, and how to uh, prevent and to uh, mitigate them. So the hidden fires, uh, it's sometimes inside the building structure, the attic, a ventilation gap, uh, they are quite often um, before they are again on the pictures, but these are typically fires which were started like a, as a hidden fire, uh, fires where um, you uh, uh, had something hidden and, and was burning uh, inside. It's difficult for the rescue service to access and extinguish, and I think there are, I don't have to explain you that. You're better uh, than me in this part. Uh, um, so, uh, but... Uh, it's also a bit slower development. It's not this, poof, uh, but it can be this uh, intensive fire, certainly at a certain moment if something is being opening and so on. And I, again, um, well, many of you maybe have uh, got this type of uh, fires. Uh, fires in building materials, uh, they can, of course, start at uh, the roof or the facade. Uh, then, of course, once it comes outside, there's good supply of air. There's no problem. You have vertical flame spread, uh, and you have a lot of influence of external conditions. Uh, the picture to the right is a attic fire where you don't see the attic anymore because it burned off completely, but where inside the construction, uh, 
there was fire growth inside the whole, let's say, wall construction. And then it's important to know what type of things there are uh, in these walls uh, and to assess, let's say, the risk. Uh, here you see also this typically where you have suddenly a fire. Um, in both cases, I'm not going to say the countries or places. Uh, you can imagine this is not in Sweden. We don't have so high-rise buildings at the moment yet. Um, when we looked, and if I, I point on this, I think there was yesterday a joke of, of the people from UL, uh, what are you doing here? I was some, some, somehow wondering what they are doing here. Uh, if somebody can say me why, I'm going to be happy going away from here back to, to Sweden. Um, the uh, characteristics of these fires, uh, as I said, uh, initiated sometimes as a compartment fire, it's in the concealed uh, space. It's about a lot, sometimes, uncertainty about the fire separation, how they really work. Uh, and when um, the rescue service uh, arrives, um, the situation will depend a bit. It depends, is also one of these uh, typical expressions, how to tackle it. Uh, and most of the time, the, the first task of the rescue service to do life-saving measures. And in these case studies, we could see that uh, the life safety measures or, or the actions there were prioritized, and at the time, the fire started growing somewhere else, uh, which was not focused on the uh, area where they wanted to do the life-saving uh, actions. And this is uh, good. And sometimes they are uh, under sized initially by the, the rescue service. And maybe I've also got, and we have got already some examples yesterday also, that, that some <coughs> certain things happen where you had not expected to happen, this type of uh, big sudden uh, fires. Um, what are characteristics of successfully managed fires? Um, this is a bit that it's important for the fire services to know also the building. I and mean, like we said yesterday, I think it was in the smoke gas explosions also, it's of course very difficult if you stand in front of this and you say, what's behind this type of, of steel and so on. Uh, and I, today's, let us say, technology is of course uh, increasing more and more. And I think at the discussion this morning, we have BI, BIM systems uh, in the future, we can get more and more information what's really uh, in the building as type of materials and you could make an assessment um, and the way to the place, or is there certain risks if you could develop enough uh, knowledge around this and make, let's say, expert systems who give you a first impression, look out here, these and these things are in this building. Um, knowledge of fire dynamics is, of course, important, uh, also for uh, the operation there, uh, and also to, to use effective actions to extinguish fire. And we, looked on a number of successful cases with high pressure cutting devices and, and thermal cameras as uh, tools where you could uh, use uh, to have these concealed spaces um, um, attacked. Um, the last, I think I've, is it five minutes left or something like that? Is that correct? Um, is residential fires. This is an ongoing project. So I've, we have publications already out, uh, but we have come to the most critical thing, which is cost-benefit also here. And uh, now we're talking a bit more difficult things. In school fires, it was easy for cost-benefit. You know what it costs if a building is burned down. But if you have as a goal to reduce the fatalities, what's the price on a human life? Uh, and there we have, uh, of course, some um, some small problems, but also some solutions which are used in, in traffic safety in, in, in Sweden. Our um, uh, MSB, or governmental body, got from the, uh, uh, the government, in fact, the task to investigate this. Um, we, uh, we have this 100 fatalities in Sweden uh, every year. I, I'm, I know it's statistics, not in detail, but that means about one fatality per 100,000 uh, habitants. Uh, that's one. I think we are in the area, Germany, uh, the Netherlands, we are somewhere 0.5, uh, roughly. Uh, let me 
uh, not stick on the numbers, but you, we have about double from, let's say, the content. And our government doesn't like that, of course, um, because we want to be the best. Uh, uh, or, uh, so MSB, the, the uh, contingency agency, suddenly say, OK, we're going to have this zero vision. Of course, zero vision mean, does not mean that you cannot have any uh, residential uh, debts anymore. But the actual goal they have put is to reuse debts and injured in residential files by 33% before 2020. It's easy to write that down. <laughs> you understand what I mean? To increase knowledge also on individuals and to you increase the number of fire detector, fire equipment and so on in, in homes. Uh, and then they realized, okay, how, how are we going to do that? Yeah, we have to, to do research. So they started three research projects of two years ago, <coughs> where, again, cooperation between Rice and Lund University is tackling the technical part. Again, this is not only a technical part. I did a pre-study, I think, in 2009 already, uh, which was before, let's say, the governmental task of MSB, uh, and I came to the conclusion is that uh, most of fertilities, uh, and, and we're going now into a too sensitive political area, is that the people who are killed in fires are those people who cannot act when the fire occurs. They cannot get out on themselves uh, in the building. And then it's easy to point out the older people, the younger people, become immediately in the people, who have probably alcohol or drug problems and so on, and, and social uh, status, cultural status and so on. So it's, uh, it's getting a bit shaky for a technical engineer to get in these type of uh, discussions. Um, we also added uh, to this MSB project another project which is complementary to look on success factors. We not only want to say what's going wrong, and we would try to figure out, OK, these fires have happened. Uh, um, what happened in order that you would not be killed? So we, it's a little bit more difficult. The other ones go very quickly in the statistics to be detected. The ones with the success we have to contact. So we've been using quite some social media and so on to get people reacting. What, what helped me to survive my residential fire? A typical statistics result is, of course, uh, residential fires are the red ones. Uh, just see, chimney fires are quite high, and this is the percentage of total number. Kitchen fires also. But if we don't look to the fatal, the chimney fires drop down. There are almost none. Uh, but then you get the, the bed, uh, living room, bedroom, and so on. Unfortunately, we have this uh, fantastic place which is called Unknown, uh, which is not so easy to detect, but uh, there are also quite a big amount of them. So one of my PhD students, because much of this work um, is, is also done by PhD students, is uh, so uh, looking to look to the statistics and then picked up 144 fatal fires. The case, if there's a fatal fire in Sweden, the investigation requirements are much higher. So and we try to establish scenarios which measures would have been effective try to classify the cases in case studies with different variables and also see if there's some kind of misclassification and do some iteration. So it's a bit the same graph, but now it's from the top to the down. There are two papers already published uh, recently on it. And uh, then at the end, you do some kind of classification of the, the full da data set. It's maybe a bit abstract now, but we got now into this more advanced statistical analysis. Uh, but at the end of the day, you, you do this so-called multiple correspondence analysis. Uh, you, you can maybe get different populations, different groups of fires. This is just an, an example of a stove fire where there's no further ignition. Uh, stove fire with ignition, that means with ignition of, of the <coughs> ventilation system and, and uh, the kitchen and so on. Technical fault, external fires, chimney fires and so on. So. Um, you also have to start clustering people. And now we come to this called, which I think in English would call, be called PC. It's not a computer, but it's politically correct. Uh, how easy can you put people in boxes? How much will people be offended being in such a box? Um, this is quite. So, but what you can see if we look to all 
all, uh, let's say this is the risk compared to the entire population, which means one is the entire population. If you look to all of uh, the people and you look to the smokers, then you have about four times bigger risk if you're a smoker to being killed in a fire. If you then look to age and to gender, um, and we go down meet to the right, so I skip uh, the sensitive also parts, is uh, that it's 45 times more risk if you're 85 and you're smoking and you're uh, in that area. Men is, all, men is also much higher risk if you're above 50, so I'm already in this risk zone. So uh, we have a lot of data on that, so you can look into the papers, and I don't want to go into detail because somewhere there is also a time constraint, but I want to give some rough ideas. I throw it into the audience. Uh, we found that this, through this cost, through clustering stage case studies, we've so seen some trends, and some of them are interesting to think about. Uh, older smokers uh, uh, are dominating, I've told that already. Uh, about 85 plus, uh, if you use resistant clothing, this is very efficient. And that's connected then immediately to the last part, where if you are older than 85%, uh, and the chance that you've been killed of a fire is because you're smoking, if you're a smoker, because we are talking about smokers here, cigarette falls on your clothing, start burning. And then maybe a sprinkler is not your solution for saving that person. So it's maybe saving the person next to there, but not there. Very sensitive also again, uh, but it's important to know for smokers between the 50 and 84, uh, there, there's a benefit of using so-called flame retardant bedding, whatever that could uh, be, but you know I, I, what I'm telling. Also to use better furniture. I already people talking, so it's uh, interesting. That's good. It's great some reaction. Finally, the risk of me uh, being more than 50 years uh, is about 10% uh, if you're not that age. So you, we, go, we see this aging problem, and I've saw some interesting reports here also uh, from the Netherlands uh, outside to, to look in that. Uh, also, the electrical systems is again uh, a problem for older uh, and uh, there are a number of fertilities, uh, unfortunately, that people try to extinguish uh, it and could not survive because they were maybe not uh, well uh, trained or they were not in the condition, uh, if you talk about that also, especially in the older generation. So, um, so these are some things I throw into it. Um, you can say, okay, it's easy to say that. We have the statistical and the case studies as a background, so it's quite solid and it's also proven by a number of uh, publications. Uh, finally, I want to say that using statistics and case studies are the, is powerful to use, let's say, investigations to consequences of fires, uh, but also trying to find solutions how you can uh, decrease the consequence. And we have examples in arson fires, construction fires, residential fires, and if you can even connect it with costs, uh, you can do cost-benefit analysis. You can start comparing what might be the best solution if you can use probabilities. Of course, everything falls or stands if you have good statistics. If you don't have it, yeah, bad luck, maybe, I have to say. You can start using it from other countries, but it's not so easy. So, but anyhow, so I, I firstly somehow am very happy that I've now been 10 years in, in Lund and that we got this kind of use of statistics and case studies also. When I started in 2008 and 9 with the arson uh, fire um, project, I said, well, we're going to use the fire investigation reports because this knowledge is there. And, and these people sometimes frustrate because they write these reports, they do all this good work, and then it's filed, and it's there, and it's in our database, but we also want to use it. Being the academic, I mean, electrical engineer, not really an uh, um, intervention person. You get this first reaction, okay, the academics are going to look into our fire investigation reports. Okay, now, now one year or two years later, uh, the motivation of the fire investigator had increased a lot to help us. And we don't have any problems today to have a talk and a discussion between them and us 
uh, to work together to find this type of situation. And I think that, that, that's something I'm happy for, because we, we need each other in this. It's the academic world, it's the fire rescue service, it's the governmental people, it's the industry. We have to do this all together. We cannot do it alone. So I think that's important. So, um, yeah, a lot of publications. We tend to publish also a lot in English, not only in, in Swedish. Um, could be good. You can ask more questions to me or to one of my PhD students. That's even easier for me. Um, and this is our website. We try to update that also quite a lot. So thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, yeah, maybe I've gone a little bit over time, but that's normal for me. Thank you. Uh Yep, Mr. Pedro Fernandez. Perhaps you could come down. Yes. Um, I have one question and then a few questions maybe from the audience. If no problem, this uniform is uh, scary sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's working together with uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. fire brigades and science. Exactly. <laughs> um, from the perspective uh, from the firefighter saving lives. Um, if you should advise them, uh, should they increase their knowledge on uh, building constructions or should they increase their knowledge on fire dynamics? Both, I think. That's an answer from a professor. <laughs> it's, it's, no, but I, I think it's, it's also important to get more knowledge on constructions uh, these days. But it's as well important to, to know the dynamics. <laughs> and they, they are a bit connected to each other because I think the the constructions are becoming more complicated. We see all these in advanced systems and uh, building constructions. And, and yeah, I can understand it's sometimes scary to know what's in front of you uh, and how the dynamics will be. Yeah. So we have to learn also a lot more, I think, not only the fire rescue service, but also the research on the fire dynamics of these type of fires. Yeah. So which were not a problem in the beginning. Okay, but so. um, well, I think it is my opinion that uh, the knowledge on uh, uh, building constructions um, is not enough. No, no, it's not yeah. enough. Um, and it's always sensitive to say that it's not enough because it can imp it's, it's at a certain level. So when I think it has to, to, um, to be um, increased of everybody, I think, because we, oh. we have new systems and, and I th uh, it's getting more complex, complex system, new energy systems on, let's say, into, into the buildings yeah. and so on. So it's, it's, it's very getting very a real profession. Yeah, it's, uh, um, questions for oh, there's a lot. Uh, uh, yeah, this, some of these things are sensitive. I right will now. throw. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Hello. Yeah. Uh, just I'm a little bit curious about the uh, uh, percentage of uh, arson fires in in Sweden. What what I learned from one of your, yeah, not colleague in in Belgium is uh, a risk engineer uh, at the uh, insurer company mm -hmm. is that 25% uh, of all fires in Belgium arson fires. What's the percentage in, uh, in Sweden? Yeah, we, we, we knew how much it was for, for the school fires, but we are, we are also having a, a very high number. The only thing is that we have this un in also with the cause of fire. So we somehow in the order of 25%, 30%. But we have also 25, I think, roughly 30% of fires, which we don't know whether it was arson or whether it was an accident okay. and so on. So it depends a little bit how much there are in that population. But they are quite high, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, we have we have three. We so do there's this. No regulation for, for actual. Uh, <sighs> Not for. Uh, well, there is regulation for the building materials. That they are. Yeah. So I, I think that's that's the case. But if the attack is from the outside, let us say, then then it's more sensitive. Uh, we have very tough regulation on facades systems uh, with an SP 105 test. For for the but if it's uh, um, maybe another type building, it's low rise building, then then you can use. Yeah, quite a lot of materials, let's say. Thank you. Uh, uh, another you question. You talked about the difference in probability. Yeah. Uh, uh, during the day, the probability is higher for school fires, but the damage is higher at evening and night. Yeah. We see similar data. We're struggling with a good measurement of the impact or size of a fire. So what kind of uh, measurements do you use for damage or impact of a fire? Um, of course, this is uh, something we... Um, used a lot, let us say, the case studies to make this estimate of damage in order to use it inside the cost-benefit analysis. We did these experiments and we could establish uh, a fire growth 
on the facade or into the attic and determine this kind of area growth into some kind of a damage area. And also the fact that if you don't detect it, it's almost going like that, total loss. Because even if the fire is um, being maybe successfully limited to part of the building, there's also a lot of water damage and, and so on, so they choose to rebuild everything. Yes. Thank you. There was one question over there. Uh, I was always uh, told that uh, uh, most of the people, uh, fatalities uh, in, a, in a fire, uh, were killed by the smoke they uh, inhaled, the toxic uh, fumes that uh, exist. Um, how do you look at that uh, if you're talking about successfully, um, you know, the residential areas, uh, uh, you be prefer to do something about the smoke or you try to extinguish the fire as soon as possible? I think we here again the answer is uh, a little bit uh, diplomatic maybe also, but uh, we try to... I have to go to that. I'm not in allowed to go to the, the side in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyhow, it's, um, it's, it's somehow both actions. It's the prevention part and, and let's say, the uh, mitigation part also. And we do look, uh, and luckily we have quite a lot of data. More and more data is appearing also on, on what is the uh, type of uh, death cause uh, in the fire. So yeah. we, we're looking to that. Uh, in the statistics, it's a bit more difficult because that's somehow hidden. It's it's quite sensitive in information, but you can you can see certain, uh, and we're looking to that also uh, into the the project. Um, you have, of course, um, combustible materials in everything in an, in a housing, so you you cannot live in, live in a concrete uh, building and uh, concrete chairs and so on. But I think it's uh, something where we have to to look into and, and of course carbon monoxide is something which is detected easily uh, and other factors also. But in certain cases it, it's like with older people they, they just burn uh, also because the cigarette ignites their clothes uh, and then it's um, there are very small amounts of prevention things. Yeah. So if, if, uh, um, <coughs> if you are a smoker then uh, the chance, the risk that you inhale smoke you don't want to inhale is bigger. Is even bigger, yes. Yeah. So you have double effect, eh? Double, uh, double. Uh, you have the smoke from effect. the cigarette and from the fire yeah. right, later. That's not good. <laughs> yeah. um, last question and then we go for the coffee break. Uh, all questions are on this side. Uh, so, uh. That's statistically a bit of uh, a problem. It's, yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> You, you touched the point of uh, evaluating the, the benefit of uh, reducing damage of uh, fires and also the uh, possibility to, to reduce the fatalities. Uh, but not, uh, you, you said it's, it's a delicate question, how much money is a human life worth? But you did not uh, give the answers. Can you give some, uh, <laughs> some views on that? I don't want to give numbers here in, in the, the food public, but th there are numbers being used also by the insurance companies. Um, and they depend a little bit, and they depend on for a little bit on age also. So that amount reduces if you're getting older. So. And it's very scaring to see that, to be honest. Yeah, yeah exactly. So um, even in the medical sector, there are numbers put on somebody if they do certain treatments and and this has been researched on in in sweden also that there are some hidden num roots yeah something it's in that order and and they have used it in in sweden the so-called uh cost for a statistical life which is a nice word in uh, transport sector uh and the road administration have used that to say okay if we invest so many millions in uh what do you call it, rags between the two lanes, um, we invest at the places where it's critical. A bit like I've said also where when there's a critical thing we invest, we can see a benefit if we reduce the number of, um, we can reduce the number of fatalities there. And that's the zero vision in, in, um, in um, road traffic in Sweden, which has been successfully. So the last 10 years, you can see this trend going down. So the measures have, an effect on numbers, but also then, of course, on cost. 
So, uh, and it's, but it's a little bit more difficult for fire because there are different governments who control uh, the regulation. But that's a local problem, so I don't have to bother you about that. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Patrick van Hees. Uh, yeah. You know, the yeah. 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 In, in, research, in research first, uh, the good questions come and the answers will follow later. Yes, yes uh, okay. and we always consider to be solving the questions also. Oh. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, we go for a coffee break. Uh, we start again at 11.30.